Hello, my name is Arf Mbati and I'm here at the European Parliament to find out more about the BNP and its leader, Nick Griffin. Nick, thanks for joining us. Um, Nick, what fired you up in your teen years to do what you are doing now? Uh, that's a long story. I grew up in a very political family. My parents met at a Communist Party meeting, which they'd gone to disrupt as um, right-wing conservatives in the days when there was good old sort of rough, rough and tumble and serious political debate. Uh, so always had a political background. Uh, the, one of the first political memories I've got is of Enoch Powell's speech in 1968, talking about immigration. My parents saying, well, thank God someone's said something finally about it. Uh, and then the key thing was in the 1970s, we had a conservative government, which was fundamentally very liberal. Ted Heath was a little bit like David Cameron. Uh, and everyone on the left and the right of politics considered that Britain was gradually, every couple of years you had a Labour government, then you had a Conservative government. Each time the Labour Party was in power, it dragged the part country to the left. Each time the Conservatives were in power, they just sat there. And there was a feeling widespread across British political society that we were going to end up effectively as a communist state by degrees. This was the depth of the, depth of the Cold War. Uh, and I was fundamentally anti-communist. I'd read a lot from a young age. Uh, and that was the key thing that made me think that I can't just sit here and do nothing. Um, I should do something to try and make a difference. And, you know, a lot of people um, regard you as being extreme. I mean, why are you so against, for example, Islam? Islam um, has been quoted in many programs and you know, a lot of ethnic minority, especially Islamic, think you're against them. What would you say to people like that? I'm not against Islam per se. Uh, I think that uh, the West should leave the countries of the Muslim world alone and not try and convert them into uh, pseudo-Western democracies or just go in and take their resources. Uh, but I believe that there's a fundamental clash between the values of Islam and the values of West on things such as freedom of speech. Can the law be made by man or is it all in the Quran? That's a fundamental clash, a fundamental, fundamental clash on things such as uh, the rights of women. Are women worth half a man in the court or are they equal? Uh, and I think that this forcing two very, very different ways of running the world together in a very small, overcrowded I island is a recipe for disaster. And, you know, talking about Islam and, like, uh, fundamentalists, for example, I mean, how, mon how many fundamentalists do you think there are in Britain? Islamic fundamentalists? I don't know. What I do know is that every now and again, my, uh, one of my phone numbers gets put up on a far-left website and it uh, filters into, uh, you know, into young Muslim circles. And when that happens, I get a heck of a lot of calls from very angry young Muslims who are initially angry about me. Sometimes we end up talking and they're angry about you know, the Middle East and various, various things. They're actually much more political than a lot of English kids. Uh, and uh, I would say that... Obviously those calls are self-selected, but I think that they're fairly representative of the young Muslim street, especially in working class areas. There's an awful lot of radicalism out there. And as I see it, each new generation is actually more alienated from Western society, Western culture, and more radical than the previous one. So I think there's a lot and that it's growing. And do you think that the young Muslims, particularly, um, or, or black people, are more got more hatred against yourself, or do you think the party as a whole? I don't know, you don't ask them that. <laughs> uh, what do you think? Do you think you're a go good role model and why? A good role model for whom? For the British party, political parties as a whole, and for people who vote for them? Uh, I would say so, because unremittingly we tell the truth. Every other party uh, will uh, spin and look at what the public want to hear, and then try and sell what they want to do by doing that. We just tell it like it is. And some people greatly admire us for it, other people hate us for it, but I think everyone accepts that we tell it like we see it. And I think if everyone did that, then the voters would be at least voting on the issues as they're really going to be, instead of voting according to spin. I mean, most parties at the moment, I mean, I'm sure you're aware, a lot of people have lost trust in politics, mm. um, especially with the politicians, you know, have been saying one thing but doing another. Yeah. Do you really think that you're a party that says how it is, or do you think a party you're saying what you think is what it should be? We're saying what we think the problem is, and people can take it and leave it. The others don't do that. They say they've, they've got what they want to sell. So in the Tory party case, for instance, but the Labour Party as well before that, they want to privatise everything. The political elite has been bought and paid for by the corporations. They're going to privatise everything. But they don't say it like that. They cover it up in all sorts of things. We're going to give, give you choice in the health service. No, they're not. They're going to take it away 
and then if you can pay for it, you can get what you can pay for. It's a huge shift, they don't tell the truth. Okay, Nick, now you're regularly described as being fascist. Obviously on other interviews you are quoted that you're not a fascist. Um, can you tell me about, more about your views about fascism um, and what kind of image you're exactly wanting for the BNP party? Yeah. Fascism, if it means anything other than just a pointless smear, historically uh, it's about uh, a close, almost incestuous relationship between big business and the state. And in 1930s fascism, the state was on top and big business worked with it. It was the junior partner, and he did well out of it, it was the junior partner. Uh, and there was one other factor of fascism was the use of applied violence against political opponents uh, to repress people. Now, as a party, the British National Party sits firmly within the, the old British tradition of absolute freedom of speech, freedom of association, and people can vote for who they want to and all the rest of it. So we're not fascist in that sense. Violence is directed against us. We never do anything other than defend ourselves if the police won't do it. And as regards the question of the, the state and the corporations, Britain is now a sort of a hyper-fascist state because it's moved to the point where government is the junior partner with the corporations and they are the ones who call the shots. So I'm an anti-fascist and if you want to look at real fascism in Britain, you look at Tony Blair, you look at what the government's doing and it's classic fascism, including the use of force or allowing uh, pseudo gangs like Unite Against Fascism uh, to attack us. Uh, and other nationalists. Uh, it's organised by, it's accepted by the government. David Cameron signed up to Unite Against Fascism, which uses violence against its political opponents. So Britain is a fascist state. I'm an anti-fascist. And what about your methods? I mean, there's been a lot of, you know, YouTube, for example, there's been a lot of um, uh, people that are, you know, holding banners of BMP. Now, you can argue they may not be BMP, just holding the banner and using it as a, as a sort of political force. Uh, but there's been videos of, you know, like violence, hatred uh, towards Muslims. Uh, I'm sure there's been other way around as well. Um, and do you think that the BM party, the British National Party, could be responsible for this? No, I don't at all. There's a great deal of tension, resentment and hatred on all sides, as you say, within any multicultural, multi-ethnic society. And the more different groups you've got, the more balkanised it becomes. Uh, if uh, everyone goes along with the pretense that everything's fine, and in particular that if you've got one section of the population which feels and really is aggrieved, and I would say that's the case of the white working class, who are absolutely the bottom of the, bottom of the heap, if uh, they're denied even recognition of their grievances. If they're denied a way to express those grievances in a political way, then that's the recipe for trouble. And if anything, the British National Party uh, is a safety valve. And if we weren't there, you may not like what we say and what our voters say, but if we weren't there giving people the chance to express their concerns through the ballot box, they're more likely to go out and do it in some stupid, vicious, harmful, negative way. So I think it's a good thing that we're there to let people express their concerns legitimately. Right, and um, what are your views about the EDL? I mean, a lot of people say you're one party but with a different name. Some people say that EDL is copying the BNP in the same route but less violent, for example. Um, others say that is a way to take over the BNP, to take over yourself. What, what do you think about the EDL? Well, the EDL? British National Party isn't violent. Any violence near us is when we're attacked by the far left and by our opponents. Uh, it's not from us. As for the English Defence League, I've got a lot of respect and time for a lot of the rank and file. They're putting themselves uh, out on the streets peacefully, overwhelmingly. Uh, they're taking risks in doing so. They're repressed by the police, people who lost their jobs and so on. I've got time for them. But the leadership of the EDL and the thing as a whole, it is quite simply a Zionist front organisation, which is financed in the end from the United States. Uh, and its purpose is to heighten and encourage a clash of civilizations because the neocons and the, the far right of the Zionist spectrum, uh, the, the Likud Ghanists, they want Europeans and Muslims fighting on the streets of Europe so that when they then, as they want to ethnically cleanse Palestine of all the Palestinians, uh, a lot of public opinion thinks, well, I wish we could do that in Britain, I wish we could do it in France or Denmark, and that's what the EDL is there for. It's a false flag front group run by and financed by Zionists. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a big claim. Uh, it's, a, it's a big it's claim, a but, if, big but if, if, if your viewers just give us a couple of weeks, uh, and uh, I'm at present partway through a document, the key parts relating to Britain are 20,000 words already. All of it's factually backed up. It's a crystal clear pattern. Uh, you can look in uh, Haaretz, uh, the, the fairly left-wing Israeli paper, uh, and they talk about it, this point is there as well. But I've 
pull this together. It's a very clear picture. Uh, it's a big claim, but it's true. Could you see yourself working with the EDO anytime in the future, together, as partners, um, any, 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 any way possible? I think it's highly unlikely because although we agree that radical Islam is a threat in Britain, so we've got a point of agreement there, uh, we as nationalists believe that Britain should not be involved in foreign wars, foreign quarrels. Uh, so we want our troops home immediately from Afghanistan. We didn't want our troops to go to Iraq. We're fervently opposed to what's going on interfering in the Middle East, be it Libya and then Syria. Uh, and in particular, we do not want the neocon Zionist war that's coming on Iran. Whereas the EDL leadership are all in favour of that. So there's a huge difference between us. Uh, so we're no more likely to work with them uh, realistically at that level than we are with George Galloway in respect, with whom we agree on some things and other things we disagree. Right, okay, let's move on to the BNP party now as, as a whole. Um, can you tell me the main principles of this party and what it really means? Yeah, the British National Party is really what it says on the box. It's a party about British nationalism. Nationalism is a, uh, a political philosophy uh, which says that society isn't about just individuals, atomised and so on, make as much money as you can for yourself, grab it quick and run. Mm. Uh, it, re it regards the nation as having uh, uh, an entity, it's the largest part of an extended family. The nation has uh, uh, an existence of its own, has rights of its own, its own to be considered. Future generations need to be taken into account. The sacrifices of past generations need to be considered, rather than anything decided what's going to be best for the people running the country for the next six months. So we're a party of nationalism. We believe that every nation has the same rights, but we're particularly concerned in Britain. It's not our business or duty to interfere in other countries. The fundamental rights are for a nation to govern itself and for the government chosen by the people to govern that, pe that country in the interests of the people of that country and not in the interests of one particular class, big business uh, or whoever is paying them the most money from abroad. Well, it seems to me there that you sort of summed up what the UKIP stands for, United Kingdom Independent Party. No. Um, so what would you say the difference <coughs> between yourself and UKIP? The difference there is that UKIP is obviously fervently uh, anti European party. Uh, we're fervently against the Britain's membership of the European Union and have been for a lot longer than uh, UKIP. You know, I was campaigning as a, as a young teenager in 1975 in the referendum to get Britain out of the common market uh, when most of the people in now in UKIP were Conservatives happily going along with it. Uh, so, but we've got the same position on Europe. But there it ends because UKIP isn't a nationalist party because UKIP wants to get out of this mm -hmm. and hop over basically to becoming uh, an extra state in the United States. It's a completely Atlanticist party. Uh, it has no interest in British self-determination. It wants free trade with the rest of the world. If you have free trade with China, you can say goodbye to every piece of manufacturing industry in Britain because we can't compete with the fact that China's wages are so much lower, with the fact they've got no environmental protections in their factories and so on. Uh, so UKIP is there for free trade and for big business. We're there saying that the government has a right and a duty to organise the economy for the interests of the British people and not for a, han a, sh uh, a handful of shareholders and banks who are the people who basically finance UKIP. Um, one of the questions we opened up um, online and on the internet is uh, before we were going to interview yourself uh, was uh, what would you do with the Equality Act? Because surely you believe British jobs for British people. So surely there would need to be like a discrimination in this law so it would not be equal. What would you do with it? Uh, we scrap it because it's not the business of a government to tell anybody, including, including employers, who they can associate with, who they can employ and all the rest of it. Employers. Uh, should be free to take whoever they want, who they think is best for the job, uh, and people who run clubs, pubs or whatever, should be entitled to let in who they want and keep out who they want. And when, so the moment you've got a state which says that it has the right to interfere in people's lives to that degree, then you may at one stage like what it's doing, you've got to understand that it's a state which now has so much power that if it decides to change its direction, it's got enormous power to do wrong. So the uh, Equality Act is an example, a classic example, of a nanny state gone mad. It needs axing because the money needs to be left in the uh, pockets of the taxpayers. Right. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, a lot of people don't think you're actually understanding the Equality Act because it's a way of moving forward, you know, the Equality Act, to make sure every individual is given a f at the same right 
Um, and you know, in, even in America, the Bill of Rights, you know, uh, every country is trying to make every citizen feel welcome. Um, because there's, there's, it's very dangerous for making citizens feel not welcome and they could tend to extreme views. Um, and I think one of your policies is to combat extreme views. So don't you think discriminating would... I, I'm, I'm completely against discrimination. And the problem is that what we've got is massive state-sanctioned discrimination against the indigenous people of Britain. Uh, and the other is making people uh, concerned, worried. It's making huge numbers of middle-class people leave the country to go to Spain. And it's making work, working-class people who can't leave very, very angry, increasingly dissatisfied from and disconnected from the polit political process, but still worried about the problems. And that's a big risk. Uh, and we've had now 40 years of brutal discrimination against the white working class, so that white working class boys are absolutely the bottom of the heap in their educational attainment, that uh, you have all sorts of government agencies uh, in so, uh, using taxpayers' money to advertise jobs to ethnic minorities only. I think that's wrong. It's vicious against the indigenous majority. It's also bad for the members of ethnic minorities who get there under their own steam because they're the right man or woman for the job. Because people look and say, oh, he, she only got that job because they're black. Because many people do only get the job because they're black or Asian or whatever. And the people who don't get even a chance at many of those jobs because they're discriminated I mean, against are the British people. The Nick, I mean, that's why it claims, I mean, no, you know, you, the, the, the Equalities Act and the, all that legislation, it's directed, well, basically, they write off a big section of the population as white. And then they say that a section of the population defined only, again, ethnic, you know, only, if, only if, in that way doesn't to, have any protection. If we, if we go back to the Equality Act, the Equality Act makes sure there is no discrimination. It's about for people um, getting in, not because of their colour, but because it's equal. No one's going to discriminate against no, each other. Like um, it's about that and for everyone except, to, except the British, except the indigenous white majority particularly against the English. Yet yeah, the English, we're not even allowed to classify ourselves on all sorts of forms. We're an invisible people. We pay the taxes. Our ancestors fundamentally built the country, but we are an invisible and oppressed people in our own country. But technically, all ethnic minorities, you can argue, was actually originated in Africa. So everyone from Africa came to pay that. So we can't really, you know, use that as such. Um, yeah, of, and, of, course, and, of course we can. I'll tell you why. If you were interviewing, uh, if you were talking about Australia, you wouldn't for one minute say that the Australian Aborigines, they're just another group of people living in Australia and they should have no special benefits whatsoever because they're exactly the same as the Europeans who've been there for only 200 years. You wouldn't dare say that because it's fundamentally racist because the uh, Aborigines are the first people of Australia and they have certain special extra rights and we, my people, are the first people of the British Isles and of Europe. Okay, let's talk about the two policies we talked about. One of them was that you said that a lot of British people are moving abroad um, because of jobs and because they're getting maybe fed up with people, a lot of immigrants coming into the country. But then there's a, it's a widely regarded fact that was done in 2011, 10 and 2009 that a lot of people, mostly middle class, who do leave the country, can afford to leave the country, 98% in a survey of 4,000 people said they leave it because for retirement, not because the, there's less jobs or they feel dissatisfied with Britain. The majority of those would say, you're right, it's, it's not about jobs, primarily that. Uh, some young people are going abroad with it, you know, for jobs, but there again, most parts of the world, there's not many jobs. So most people leaving the country are early retired, people have made it themselves. Uh, and I know, because I speak to hundreds of them, uh, that you know, every year, uh, the, the key reasons they're going are the weather, which is obviously beyond anyone's control, mm -hmm. uh, but they're again getting sunburned in Spain all the time, soon wears off and, you know, as, as a pleasure. The other thing is taxation, and the other thing is they just don't feel at home in Britain anymore, because the Britain that, even I am 52, the Britain I remember, uh, growing up in is utterly different to the Britain we have well, it now. Be, it's globalisation. It's globalisation, yeah, you know, it, um, oh, the, the freedom to manoeuvre. No, no, no globalisation. Half in the Eurozone, you know, and free oh, trade no. between going to different countries. Yeah, I know Don't why you think it's is, is benefiting Britain? It's actually one of the things that are benefiting Britain doing this. So having your policies in place, would, you could say isolate Britain, you know, uh, people will, uh, will move out of Britain. Uh, the British identity and the international relations would be very isolated. You know. well, let's look first of all at the question you were saying globalisation, implying it's a force of nature. It's like uh, gravity. You, know, you have your mobile phone, you let go of it, it falls to the floor. Globalisation is not like gravity. It's a set of political decisions made by a political elite because bankers and corporations have paid the bastards to do it. That's what it is for a start. So globalisation didn't have to go through and it can be held up or reversed. Now, I agree 
that there's a point to which you know, going to other countries and seeing other countries and exchanging recipes and so on and things like this and seeing other people's cultures, it's part of what makes human life interesting and it's it worthwhile. Does, yeah. But mm. what we know in, in Britain isn't a matter of a few people coming in and bringing some strange cultures and different recipes. My capital city, the city I was born in, I'm about to become a minority in that city. That isn't a bit of manageable immigration. That is colonization on a vast scale, and it's destroying the identity of this country. On the world as a whole, this is a problem that all humanity has to get to grips with. That at present, there's about, according to ethno ethnographers, there's about 5,000 different cultures, languages, different ways of feeling you belong and being human in the world. By the end of this century, there's gonna be about 800 left because they're being wiped out by the forces of globalization. Now, if that was happening to every other species, everyone would say this is terrible because it's a wipeout of diversity. Human diversity is being destroyed by globalism and big business and capitalism. And to say that isn't to hate other people, it's just to say that diversity is something which needs to be nurtured and cherished. It's, it, it's, a very, it's a very delicate West, flower. Isn't it the Western's fault? It, the West is the one that's globalizing. It is the Western country, including the UK, being one of the top eight richest countries that are actually globalizing. It's the West, it's the West's elite. Fault. Yeah, and, sure. But don't, and, don't, don't expect the working class of Britain uh, to pay the penalty for what a greedy elite is doing because they were screwing the working class of Britain long before they were screwing anywhere else in the world. Okay, let's, let, let's move on to sort of like end point. Why, why cannot, you know, different coloured people, different ethnic minorities, such as in other countries, you know, you see, um, for example, Australia or you, or you see, for example, like even... India, for example, where there's a lot of Westerners going into each other's countries, you know. Um, but we, let's concentrate on Britain. Why, why can we not get on with each other? Well, let's look at other countries, because when you make a decision, you have to think, what's the likely effect of this going to be long term? And a good way of judging that is looking at history. So let's look at the places in the world where there's mayhem and chaos, places like, or have been recently, places like Kosovo places like uh, large parts of Central Africa, uh, places like Pakistan, places where there's terrible clashes between different people, even places like Northern Ireland. The more different people you try and put into a small area, the lesson of history is the more chance there is of terrible conflict and bloodshed, bloodshed between them. Uh, and since there's very, very few examples of a peaceful multicultural society, I think that having imposed that on Britain, Without and again, this isn't a, this isn't a problem. It's not the fault of the immigrants. Nick, I have to hurry up here because yeah, we. It, it's the fault of the elite who did it. They imposed totally undemocratically, without any uh, buy your leave from the public. They imposed a fantasy system, a utopia on Britain. We're going to turn it into a multiracial utopia. I think that was a terrible error. But uh, I'm here to give British people who agree with me a chance to express their opinions in the ballot box. OK, so now very quickly, can you tell us um, why do you think um, your, the BNP is better than Conservatives and Labour in short summary? The British National Party is better than the other parties because I would say for ordinary people in Britain, because we would run the economy and run the country on the interests of Britain as a whole and the people within it instead of a narrow sectarian group in terms of the corporations uh, and big business and the banks. Uh, so I think that if I was a banker, I wouldn't vote BNP mm -hmm. because we're going to stop them losing Britain and make sure that Britain's money is used for the benefit of Britain. If I was an ordinary person, I'd think that's what I want. Okay, let's move on to today's affairs, uh, the Eurozone. As we know, there's a big crisis going on in the Eurozone and, is it, and how is it affecting Britain, first of all? And what do you think are the steps for Britain to do now? The, the Europe as a whole, it's difficult to really, to, you can't, necessarily extract the Eurozone from Europe. They're so closely entangled. Europe as a whole is very bad for Britain. It costs us a huge amount of money, um, millions of pounds every day in direct payments, uh, which could be spent on things we need at home, like hospital beds uh, and more police on the streets. And it costs us vast amounts of money in the red tape that's imposed on British businesses. So it's gradually strangling Britain. Uh, and we should be out of it and we should use, keep our money uh, and keep our, re regain our freedom and our sovereignty and run our own affairs. Trade with Europe where it suits us and suits them, just as say Norway does, a very wealthy country, just as Switzerland does. You can work very closely with Europe, you don't have to be ruled by Europe. That's the first thing. As regards the Eurozone crisis specifically, obviously we're not in it, but it's affecting Britain. I think the latest figure is it's the crisis is now costing every British family seven and a half thousand pounds. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in lost income, and it's going to get far, far worse. Uh, it's 
in turn, that's in, uh, in, inextricably linked with a global banking crisis because we've got a rotten banking system which has looted the world for generations uh, and is in a way a separate issue, but they're connected. What I would say is that we're in the early stages of a complete unravelling of globalisation. Globalisation was based on cheap energy fueling eternal growth. Cheap energy is gone. Eternal growth is now a so fantasy. What does Britain should do what every country is just going to have to do, and is going to do anyway, uh, but the sooner we set about it, the easier it'll be, which is to work as far as possible to grow our own food, to make things in our own factories which aren't there to be made for a couple of years and then they're thrown away because that makes so maximum profit. you believe that we should get out of the Eurozone? We should leave, the, we should, well, we're not in the Eurozone, we should leave Europe. Europe, yeah. Yep. Uh, and take back control of our own affairs, and then we should set about rebuilding a manufacturing economy which is primarily designed to serve a home market instead of engaging in this horrendous around the world beggar thy neighbour uh, trade, sending goods which can be made in any, you know, could be made in Britain, we get them from China, we send goods all over the world. It's wasteful, it's destructive for the environment, and it can't carry on. Right. Thank you very much for joining us here in the European Parliament. Um, it's been good uh, for the Q&A questions and uh, we hope to meet up with you soon and uh, discuss more issues on the Eurozone. Okay, you're Thank you very much. Cheers.